Bohr's atomic model worked extremely well describing the hydrogen spectrum, but some abnormal hydrogen lines coming from a bright star threatened to completely undo Bohr's work. This is a follow-up video on Bohr's atomic model, so make sure to check that video for context. One of the first challenges that Bohr's model faced had a stellar origin, and Bohr's solution for the problem was just glorious. He solved the problem by simply multiplying by one. Let me show you the details. This is Henry Draper, an American medical doctor and amateur astronomer. He is considered one of the pioneers of astrophotography. He captured the attention of professional astronomers when he made some groundbreaking observations, including the first image of Orion's nebula and the first spectrum of Jupiter in 1880. Later quit his job at NYU's medical school to focus on astronomy. For his contributions, he received a long list of awards from international astronomical organizations. He died in 1882 and left a large collection of photographic plates and spectra. His widow passed all the materials to Draper's close friend and director of the Harvard Observatory, Edward Pickering, who promised her to complete Draper's work of classifying stars. Pickering recognized the great scientific value of the photographic record. Photographic plates were challenging the traditional technique of drawings of the images through the telescope's eyepiece, which led to unreliable records. Pickering hired a group of women to analyze the so-called Draper Memorial Collection. They joined the group known as the Harvard Computers at the observatory when the word computer was used for a person who did calculations. They not only calculated, they also studied the photographic plates, analyzed the spectra, classified the stellar objects, and determined all the relevant astrophysical properties leading to foundational discoveries in astronomy, and using the stellar spectra, they classified thousands of stars. One of the founding members of the new group created by Pickering was Williamina Fleming, a maid at the Pickering residence, whose affinity for mathematics made her a substitute teacher in her native Scotland when she was only 14 years old. In 1876, her teaching and math skills were quickly recognized by Elizabeth Pickering, who told her husband that he should find her a job at the observatory instead. Fleming became a computer and made several discoveries, including the famous Horsehead Nebula and the first White Dwarf. In 1896, Fleming discovered three sources of strange spectrum lines, including one in Zeta Pupis, one of the hottest known stars visible to the naked eye in the southern celestial hemisphere. Fleming could not properly classify these three stars because of their strange spectra and labeled them as peculiar. After notifying Pickering of the abnormal spectrum lines, he attempted to make the lines fit Balmer's formula, but failed. After trying different methods, he gave up and simply announced in a paper that these anomalous lines just could not be explained by Balmer's formula. He also presented a preliminary new formula. In this paper, Pickering also described the strong hydrogen lines identified by Annie Cannon and Louisa Wells in the newly studied stars, as well as the pulsating period of newly discovered variable stars that would play crucial roles in the measurements of cosmological distances and the discovery of the expansion of the universe, thanks to the work of Henrietta Leavitt and Edwin Hubble. But that's another story. Note that Fleming, Cannon, and Wells, the people who discovered the objects and analyzed the spectra, are only mentioned but not listed as authors of the paper. The story of the women of the Harvard Observatory is fascinating. If you're interested in an inspiring account of these pioneer but overlooked women, check the book The Glass Universe by best-selling author Dava Sobel. You will be supporting the channel by using the link in the description below. Two months later, Pickering published a follow-up article with a refined analysis showing that the peculiar spectral lines could be described by a formula similar to Balmer's but with a different overall constant, or by Balmer's formula but with a semi-integer index. Either way, these spectral lines were different. One of the most complete studies of the anomalous spectral lines was conducted in 1912 
by the British astronomer and spectroscopist Alfred Fowler. During the days when Bohr was still working on the quantum nature of the electron orbits in the hydrogen atom, sending powerful electric discharges in tubes with mixtures of hydrogen and helium, he was able to reproduce in the lab the peculiar lines from Zeta Puppies, discovered by Fleming and reported by Pickering. Fowler also found a new set of lines that, similar to those found by Fleming, also required a semi-integer index. Fowler published in December of 1912 the four formulas describing all these peculiar hydrogen lines that became known as the pickering fowler series. The next year, in 1913, Bohr's atomic model was celebrated for his remarkable explanation of the spectral lines of hydrogen. Rutherford, his mentor, and many of the great physicists of the time were having a hard time accepting some aspects of Bohr's model but the main driver of acceptance was that the model worked. After publishing the first part of the trilogy in July, Bohr extended his analysis to so-called hydrogenic elements. This name refers to elements in the periodic table beyond hydrogen but containing a single electron, like ionized helium, doubly ionized lithium, and so on. In the previous video I show you the derivation of the energy levels for hydrogen, repeating the same steps for any hydrogenic atom in which the nucleus has an electric charge Z times E, Bohr's formula for the frequency of the spectral lines becomes this. The only extra term is the factor Z squared. This is the form presented by Bohr already in the first part of the trilogy. One immediate challenge for Bohr's model was the anomalous hydrogen lines discovered in 1896 by Fleming and in 1912 by Fowler. The main issue with these new lines was the presence of the half-integer index. Let me remind you that the integer indices n1 and n2 in Bohr's formula, denoting the final and initial state of the electron in the atomic transition, arise from his quantum rule that the electron's angular momentum can only take integer multiple values of Planck's constant. The half-integers required by the pickering fowler formulas call into question the most essential concept behind Bohr's model. In other words, despite the success of the model describing normal hydrogen lines, the semi-integers in the pickering fowler series threatened to tear the model apart. Bohr knew that this was an issue that his model would have to address to be fully accepted. But how could Bohr adjust the model to accommodate the peculiar hydrogen lines without compromising its initial success? Although hydrogenic atoms are the topic of the second part of the trilogy, Bohr included a brief comment at the end of part one and the full solution in part two. Not only did he save his model in a brilliant way without any modifications, but he turned this challenge into a triumph for the model. Let me show you what Bohr did. These are Fowler's formulas, where I'm rewriting them with new for the frequency of the spectral lines and RH for Rydberg's constant instead of HN and C used by Fowler. Let's take the first relation and simultaneously multiply and divide by four. We are effectively just multiplying by one. With this, the half integer indices disappear. Now we introduce a new index k equals 2m plus 2. Since m is a positive integer, k can only take even values equal or greater than 4. With this trick, we have rewritten the so-called first principle series in this way. Let's repeat this with the second of Fowler's formulas. Multiply and divide by 4, rearrange the terms in the denominator, and introduce a new index k, this time given by 2m plus 1 which now can only take odd values equal or greater than 5. Notice that the two relations become identical. Their only difference is whether the index k is odd or even. More importantly, the new formula that we have found takes the form predicted by Bohr's model with z equal 2 and n1 equals 3. So this is Bohr's solution. He said, people, these emission lines are not hydrogen lines, but helium lines. And what you are observing are electron transitions ending at the third energy level. Imagine that these are the energy levels of a single electron in ionized helium. Highlighting the final state n1 equal 3, Bohr tells us that what Fowler called the second principle series correspond to transitions from odd levels down to the third level, whereas the first principle series 
correspond to transitions from even levels down to the third level. I invite you to repeat the same procedure with the other two Fowler's formulas. You will find again that they will be described by Bohr's model with z equal 2, but n1 equals 4. The so-called diffuse series correspond to transitions from even levels down to the fourth level, whereas the sharp series, these are the lines discovered by Fleming in Zeta Puppies, correspond to transitions from odd levels down to the fourth level. And just like that, Bohr was able to explain all the peculiar hydrogen lines without the need to modify his model in any way. His model predicted that these spectral lines come from ionized helium, which is abundant in stars like Zeta Puppies. On October 14th, Fowler published a paper in Nature confirming the agreement between the data and Bohr's formula for helium. Bohr was proven right. The success of his model describing the abnormal spectral lines encouraged Bohr to extend the model. There were plenty of other phenomena that remained to be explained, like new spectral lines when the element under study was in the presence of an electric or magnetic field. But there was one observation that was the great challenge for Bohr's model. When spectral lines were studied with high-precision instruments, very fine transitions were observed, new lines very close to each other. This so-called fine structure could not be solved by a clever multiplication by one, but it would require taking the analogy of the planetary motion of the electron to the next level, plus some relativity. The person who finally solved the puzzle was in the same room with Rutherford and Einstein at the first Solvay conference, Arnold Sommerfeld.